I now have the extreme pleasure of introducing our guest speaker this morning. Um, many of you are familiar with this person, and we are too. Marjorie Young is one of Savannah's incredible women leaders. Um, she is the owner of Carriage Trade PR, and she shares her experiences and knowledge with business owners all across the country and is very generous with her time. Um, she empowers business owners and nonprofits, the Y included, to take control of their PR, their brand, and message. She is a great friend to our YMCA and inspires others, and I know she's going to inspire you all this morning, so I will pass the microphone over to Marjorie. Congratulations on 100 and 163 years. That's fabulous. Um, so my story today is started a couple of years ago. I got into a rut. I was very, very flatlined. And I wasn't depressed, I was just in a rut. And I could not figure out why, because I had worked so hard, 20 some years to build my business. I had now, I was at a point where I had a staff that could take care of a lot of things. Um, I had a great house. I bought a really cool car when I turned 50. <laughs> what the heck, I was really, really flatlined. I, I could not figure it out. And um, I was on the internet one night and I saw an ad for a workshop. Are you flat? Are you in a rut? I was like, yep, that's me. So I signed up for it. And it turned out to be a lot of neuroscience. There's a lot of science behind why I was feeling so flat. And the reason I was feeling so flat is because I was in my comfort zone. There's, there's a, a Russian psychologist, Zerkovsky or something like that, who um, had a whole study on these comfort zones. And the comfort zone is exactly that. You're comfortable. You've arrived, you've gotten your house, you've gotten your car, you've gotten all the things you want, but you're still flat. I was like, man, what do you do? Well, the coach said, you need to get out of your comfort zone and get into the next ring, which is the learning curve, which is the learning area. They call it the growth area. And your brain needs to learn new things, to have challenges, to meet new people, go new places, be creative, learn to play the guitar, do something that you're not already doing. I guess that's how we evolved from living in a cave because we, our brains are made, meant to expand and to learn. So just knowing that completely relaxed me. I was like, phew, good. I don't need medicine. <laughs> um, and I was up in Atlanta on January 19th 2016 with my daughter. She's getting a PhD in at Georgia Tech in robotics. And I said, we need a break. This great, this really cool workshop said, let's go discover something new. So we went over to Atlantic Station and we decided to watch the movie Wild. Has anybody seen the movie Wild? It's about a 23 year old woman who walks the Pacific Crest Trail. It's a 2000 mile trek because her mother died very suddenly of cancer. So in the middle of the movie, I start not just crying, I was weeping. My daughter's like, oh my God. <laughs> Mom, do you wanna leave? I was like, no, I'm fine. Um, turns out, on that exact day, January 19, 1986, my mother died in my arms of cancer, very suddenly. And um, right then and there, I said, I am going to do a walk in honor of my mother. And uh, the next morning I went to REI. Who knows what REI is? I used to love places like these department stores to buy clothes and stuff like that. I love these outfitters now. <laughs> the world is your imagination when you go in there. And I said, I bounced in there. I said, I think I'm gonna do a walk maybe on the Appalachian Trail. And the guy was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> He put a backpack on me and he said, now I have to fill it with sand with about 35 pounds and I started to fall back. And then this couple next to me was laughing. They said, you know what? You don't have to walk the Appalachian Trail. There's a, there's a uh, trek in Northern Spain called the Camino de Santiago. 
and it's only 500 miles. I say, wow, that sounds a lot better than 2,000. Um, and the other cool thing is you only had to carry 10 pounds because you would walk and you would spend the night at hostels and then you'd walk some more and you know, it, so it was, two, it was 500 miles across 365 little villages throughout the mountains. I said, you know what? I'm gonna do that. So that night I went home and I, I watched the movie called The Way with Martin Sheen. Has anybody ever seen that? It's about a man, grumpy businessman, who um, ends up walking the Camino after his son died. And the transformation of this man is just incredible. And um, I, I got all over it. My brain was lighting up. I was like, yes, I'm going to commit. I'm going to do September 1st, 2016. I'm going to put my first foot on the, on the Camino. And I ended up um, going to the gym. I used to go to the gym, but it'd be like so boring. But now I had a purpose. I knew I was going to be walking 500 miles. So I was in there every single night from 7 o'clock on. And I did three to five miles every night. Every other day I was lifting weights. Um, every, every fourth day I walked 13 miles at Skidaway State Park. Because I knew I was going to be walking 500 miles through the mountains. A Savannah with no hills around. Yes. <laughs> um, who was I to think I could do that? And this voice kept doubting me. You know, it's like, you know, you're going to get lost. You can't do this. Well, who are you to think you can do this? And I, I just, I had to learn to turn off that chatter because it kept, it kept trying to defeat me from doing these things. So it, it took a while, but... Um, I, you know, I, my brain was still lighting up and it was still exciting trying to figure out how to get my backpack down from 20 pounds down to 10 pounds. You know, imagine um, living out of a backpack for a month and a half with three shirts and three pairs of pants, two pairs of shoes, one rain jacket and one down jacket. That's about 10 pounds. So you, you learn to wash your clothes out every night. You learn to, what, what the interesting thing on the Camino is that um, the etiquette is you be really quiet when you go into the, the hostels um, because people are sleeping and you're sleeping with about 20, 30, sometimes 40 people. So the, the etiquette is to sleep in the clothes that you're going to be wearing the next day. So you fall asleep in your hiking clothes, you get up quietly and you sneak out and you go into the bathroom and you, you pack your bag. You're, you got to be quiet because <clears throat> there's a lot of people in the room. So all these things were, it was just very exciting to me. My brain was lighting up, but um, about midsummer, I realized I hadn't cut my tags off and I hadn't made the airline reservation. <clears throat> and my cousin called me and said, hey, uh, Marjorie, how are your plans coming? I was like, you know what? Um, I'm pretty happy just working out at the gym. I probably don't need to go walk the Camino. <laughs> She said, really? I said, yeah, yeah. I was so scared. I had butterflies. I knew she was going to call me out on it, too. She said, go get some scissors now. <laughs> so I cut off the tags. <clears throat> she said, if you don't show up, you will never know. You will always regret it till the day you die that you didn't do it. She said, if you get on the trail and it's really awful, leave. I was like, that makes sense. Okay, I got butterflies again. I did fly to Europe and I ended up um, driving a little Cinquecento stick shift through the mountains. That was nerve wracking. That was lighting up my brain. Um, and it, this range of mountains started to appear and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I was like, oh my God, there goes the voice again. You can't do that. You know, that, that's crazy. You can't walk over that. Um, 4.30 in the morning, I did not sleep the night before. I ended up um, <clears throat> waking up. Well, I never really fell asleep. And I didn't eat anything the day before. But I, I woke up, um, and I remember staring at the ceiling. And that voice again was like, you are crazy. What the heck are you doing? And um, about 4.30 in the morning, I, I could start to smell coffee, and I could hear people in the hostel getting ready. 
packing and outside the window I could hear people's footsteps and the, their trekking poles. They were heading to the mountain to start to, to go over the Pyrenees. And I was, I mean, I started to cry. I was like, what am I doing? And I'm there alone. <laughs> I'm walking this whole thing alone. And I remember putting on my blue Savannah Georgia ball cap that I bought at the West in the week before I left. And I said, I gotta remember this lesson. I can't be in the future being, what if, oh my God, you can't do this. And I've gotta be right here, right now. And that ball cap kept me just watching my feet make my way up the Pyrenees Mountains. And I stayed in the now. I knew the height, the guidebook said it's gonna be seven hours to cross the Pyrenees, which is about 17 to 20 miles. 10 hours into it, I still had three more hours to go. So obviously I'm a really slow walker. <laughs> and I remember seeing this other woman on the trail. I said, hey, do you mind if we walk together? Because I'm about to freak out. <laughs> I, I just want to get there. My cell phone had died. I had run out of water. I had a big chunk of Parmesan cheese. I was so sick of eating it, but I, I had a little bit left of that. Um, and we ended up, so we wouldn't freak out, um, telling each other stories. I said, okay, I'm gonna tell two paragraphs. I'm gonna make up a story and then you add on to it. And then I added on to it. It was a crazy story. But we did that until we could finally see down in the valley the, um, the roof, the monastery at, at Roncevelles. I was like, yay! It looked really close. It was another hour getting down. And it was an hour like that. I mean, and not little pebbles, but big rocks. And, but you know what? I made it. I made it. We walked in there. It was funny. They were like, and why are y'all so late? What are you, my mom? <laughs> um, I was like, look, your guidebook said it only was going to take seven hours. <laughs> And they said, unfortunately, all the beds are full. So you just, just have to walk another half mile down. And we have some temporary shelter set up. But you know what? I survived it. And it was cool and it was fun. And at 250 miles halfway through, there's this wonderful, iconic cross on the Camino called the, the Iron Cross. And I had asked my friends back in the States, and, it's, it's customary to leave a stone on the, on the cross with a, a prayer or an intention. I said, if anybody wants to do that, I'll write your name on the stone and I'll leave it. Um, and about 30 of them did, so that was probably another couple of pounds carrying it over that mountain. <laughs> but the, um, and that mountain, by the way, is the same size as the Pyrenees. And um, so I got up there, it was so emotional. I mean, if you ever get to experience that, I mean, people just cry. It's super emotional. You're letting go. My intention was to let go of the past, to let go of the sadness, and stay out of the future. Is to be right here, right now. Because the way that I could get from the comfort zone into my learning zone was, was being in the now. That's all we have, guys. And I'm telling you, that walking 500 miles, that's what I realized. That was one of the biggest things that I had. We worry about all this stuff that probably never is going to happen. <clears throat> October 10th, 2016, at 3 p.m., I finally walked into Santiago at, at the Great Big Church, and it was the most thrilling moment of my life, to be able to walk in, and, and I, I am not Catholic, I am um, Episcopalian, but it, and mostly Catholic people walk this, this pilgrimage. Um, I saw the, uh, the tomb of St. James the Apostle, and um, it, it was super spiritual. So before I show you my two minute clip of what, it, what it's like to be on the Camino de Santiago in Northern Spain, I just want to leave this message with you. What are you doing to get out of your comfort zone? Thank you very much.
back this morning. And apparently this is the city we're walking to. It's at four. Say I've been doing this a long time, and Marjorie, I think that's the best I've ever heard up here. I commend you, Thank really. You. That was just excellent, and uh, just inspiring in many, many ways. And I'm not Episcopalian. <laughs> but, uh, I'm really not a nominational now, so but that was excellent. David enjoyed it, and uh, but to tell you what, very, very good. Thank you. It's very, very inspiring. Let's stand and have a word of prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you very, very much for this group, each person here. Uh, may God, you keep your guiding hand upon them. Bless them for their desire to serve others. I thank you for our leadership, for Joel Smoker. Uh, I count him not as just a good boss, but a good friend. I thank you for the way he diligently works to lead our YMCA's. I thank you for his vision. The Bible says that uh, without vision, the people perish. And uh, Lord, I pray that as he shared earlier, that you will open up the doors for us to do even more in the future and to be able to even do something in our downtown area that will make a difference. And so touch hearts to give us that opportunity and even in other areas as you so direct. I thank you for our leadership of Alan and the others who give their time so freely uh, to help our wives continue to go forward. And once again, I pray that uh, you'll help us to reach our goals financially. It's not about the money. It's about taking those resources to make a difference in people's lives. And uh, I've seen it. I've seen the difference it has made, the impact and the smiles on people's faces. And so, 
please help us to leave here with hearts of gratitude and hearts of thankfulness, but hearts of willingness to give and to work uh, to make our wives an even better place in the future. And I also pray specifically for our mayor and to give him your wisdom from on high. And we thank you for him and for his leadership as well. Lord, once again, we love you. And thank you for loving us. And thank you for this presentation. May we live in the now with an eye to the future and what you want us to accomplish for you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>